Well, have you ever gone on a road trip? And I don't mean a, a little road trip. I mean a big road trip. I mean you pack up the car and you're driving for, not for hours, but for days. And as I was thinking about that idea of a road trip, I feel like with Romans, we're in this 12-week road trip. And I, as I think about road trips, Sherry and I have done a cross-country road trip exactly two times. The first time we did it, we went very slow. And we went slow mostly because she was leaning outside the window of the car, I'll, I'll say this gently, emptying the contents of her stomach. She was not feeling well. And so uh, this, is, this is a couple years into our marriage, and she just didn't know what was going on, why she was feeling so queasy and sick and couldn't keep anything down. So we were slowing down and taking breaks and staying in places because she didn't feel good. Some of you have already figured out uh, she was pregnant with our first son, Zach, on that road trip. And so it was, it was long in the time, and it was long emotionally to be in a car dealing with all that. But later on... Uh, when we were empty nesters, not turn the clock ahead decades, as empty nesters, we took another road trip. And we drove the exact same distance. And instead of taking four or five days to get where we were going, we did it in 38 hours. We literally got in the car and drove straight through for 38 hours, except for stopping for gas and getting food at the gas station. And we just had somewhere to get to, and we got there. Well, as we're walking through Ro the book of Romans... A 12-week journey. Some of you go, man, the book of Romans, it's 16 chapters long. There's so much there. We're rushing through it. Maybe we're making this short road trip with this big book. Other ones of you are saying, a 12-week series at Shoreline Church, that's a long series. But whether you feel like this series is a long 12-week series or a real quick series for as big, big a book it is, I hope that along the way, we can look at each of the landmarks along the way. The most important theological themes the most important topics to look at. And I want to let you know that what we're going to, some, some of you, you love when you're traveling on a road trip. You love to stop and you like, you kind of read the plaques and take pictures in front of the landmarks and you pull off and not just off the road, but down a side road and you look at what's going on there. Well, we have something called the Shoreline Conversations podcast. It's a 12-week podcast that we're going to continue after this series. But, but those of you that want to go deeper, that will be tackling a topic in Romans, and I might say, you know, I wish I could dig more into that. But we're moving a little quicker than that. But we'll tackle that in the podcast. You'll want to jump into that podcast, the Shoreline Conversations podcast, and dig into those things. Pause, read the plaques, take some pictures, go deeper with us. That'll be a joyful way for you to kind of slow the journey down and dig in more deeply. We'll actually highlight a little bit of our next podcast right at the end of the service today. But whether you like to drive along quickly or slow down, Ultimately, uh, God is going to uh, speak to us. God is going to teach us as we walk through the book of Romans. And, and for many of you, you had the opportunity to be with us last week, uh, and it, you were able to, well, everyone was online last week because we had some smoke issues, and so uh, hopefully you were able to watch the, the service and join in with us. If you haven't done that, go back and pick that up and make sure you follow up with that. But I want to get you caught up because at the beginning of Romans, uh, Romans comes right out of the gate with the doctrine of sin. And the doctrine of sin, it's a serious, important topic. And some people don't like to talk about sin, don't like to think about sin. But God, who is the wisest being in the universe, wants us to know that to understand His grace, we have to understand sin. To understand salvation, we have to know what we're being saved from. To understand what we're going to talk about today, righteousness, we have to understand those things that make us unrighteous, not right before God. And so in Romans chapter 1, uh, the Apostle Paul paints this picture of this downward cycle of sin. And he goes through these sort of these four spirals going down, down, like down this drain, downwardly moving away from God and deeper and deeper into sin. And so in Romans chapter 1 and verse 21, we see that as sin begins to take over, our minds become arrogant. Verse 21 of Romans 1 says this, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile. Their thinking became futile. And so it says that all of a sudden as we, as we wander into sin, our thinking goes off path, off of God's ways of thinking. And then the second cycle downward, I would call it sinful hearts. First our minds go off the path, then our hearts become tainted. So in verse 24 of Romans 1, it says, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. Our hearts become hard towards God and resistant, and sin grows, and that cycle continues. And then in verse 26, 
It goes, it goes from arrogant minds to sinful hearts to sensualized bodies. Bodies that are compromised, that aren't used in the way that God's designed them for his glory, but is used for kind of whatever brings us pleasure. So in verse 26, we read this. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. And it talks about how our lusts drive us into all kinds of behaviors that aren't in line with the will and the desire of God. And then the fourth cycle in this downward journey is that we become just filled up with sin. In verse 29, we read this. Because they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. Just all kinds of sin. And if you remember last week's message, I talked about how this list of sins is just a a representative list of many, many more sins that could be listed. But when we read that list, the idea is that in our mind, something should go, ding, that one applies to me. The point of this this journey in chapter 1 is is not to make one sin stand out against another, but to make every human being recognize that I am lost in sin. I am tainted by sin. I am broken and desperately in need of a Savior. And in chapter 2, we learn that there is a righteous, glorious God who wants to make us righteous. But the problem is we try to become self-righteous. We try to make ourselves righteous, and we can't do that. That's the battle of chapter 2 of Romans, that a righteous God looks at broken, sinful, unrighteous people and wants to make us righteous. But he can't give us that gift of righteousness unless we receive it. And we won't receive it unless we push aside our false views of righteousness. Lord Jesus, we pray right now as we open up the book of Romans today, as we dig into chapter 2, God, as we talk about your righteousness, your glory, your beauty, and your power, may we see you in all the purity of your righteousness. May we also recognize our need to be made righteous by your grace. And Lord, any excuses and any ways that we try to be self-righteous, they'll never satisfy. We pray that we can set those things aside today and receive the righteousness that you offer us through Jesus Christ. Speak to us, Lord. Teach us. Instruct us by your word and change us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the book of Romans is interesting in that it really begins the first 11 chapters and the first six weeks of our series are on what we call orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is right thinking, right belief that's based on the truth of God's word. And then chapters 12 through 16, the next six sermons in our series, are based on the concept of orthopraxy. If we have right belief and thinking, we can then move to right living, right lifestyle, right behavior. And so over the coming weeks, we'll look at these and dig into these and grapple with them. But today, uh, today we, we are really digging into this reality that even though sin is real, God offers righteousness, God is righteous. So that's our focus today is the topic of righteousness, the doctrine of righteousness, God's righteousness and his call to us to become righteous, and how he makes a pathway for us to be washed clean of our sin and made righteous in his sight. So in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, so open your Bibles to Romans chapter 2, or open your Bible after Romans chapter 2. In Romans 2, 4, we see what I call the heart and desire of our God. If you, want to, if you look at the book of Romans, and you want to know the heart of God and the desire of God, look no further than, than Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Listen to these words. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Look at those words, his kindness, his forbearance, his patience. What draws us to God is not a fear of judgment. It's an awareness of his goodness. What drew me to God originally, I grew up in a non-believing home with no faith, but what drew me to the throne of God and drew me to the presence of Jesus Christ was not a fear of God or a fear of judgment. It was a profound awareness of the love and the grace and the patience and the kindness and the goodness of Jesus. That if this God exists, who could love me in the condition I'm in, who could be patient with me and good to me, I wanted to know that God. I was drawn drawn in by the the kindness and the graciousness of God. And I believe for you, if you understand who God is, he draws you to himself in that same way. And and so it's it's his kindness that leads us to repent, to turn from our sin, to turn from our old way of life and begin walking towards him. When we understand how kind and how good he is, we turn toward him. 
And, and so these words, and this is important that we get a framework when we're talking about God's righteousness and our unrighteousness and an invitation into a righteous life through Jesus Christ. We have to recognize the heart of God. He is kind. Our God is the kindest being in the universe. Yes, he's holy. Yes, he's righteous. And because of that, he's a perfect judge. But he is a kind and good God. His forbearance, that word forbearance that's used there that the Apostle Paul is inspired by the Holy Spirit to use, is a word that would be used in the ancient world for a truce. That God calls a truce with us. And let me tell you, if you're at battle with God, I know who's going to win and who's going to lose. We're going to lose. He's going to win. He's God. But God says, I will call a truce and give you time to look and see who I am and come to me. That's the goodness of God. His patience. God could judge us right now. But in his patience, he waits. The Bible says, longing that none would perish, but all would come to a knowledge of salvation. That's the patient heart of God. Every day and every moment that Jesus doesn't choose to return to this world and end it all is an act of God's patient love. And these things lead us to repentance, that draw our hearts to be broken as we're aware of our sin and warmed as we're aware of God's goodness and then cause us to repent and turn from our old way of living and run to the arms of Jesus Christ. I recognized that and ran into his arms over 40 years ago. I've never been the same. I don't know when that moment happened for you, but I know if you've come to faith in Jesus, you've never been the same. And if that moment hasn't happened for you, as we walk through Romans, you will have opportunities where God will speak to you, where you can choose to repent because of his kindness and his goodness and his patience and his forbearance and to turn from your sin and run into the arms of Jesus. I hope if you've not yet come to faith in Jesus, that happens for you during this Romans series because you will never be the same if you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And so Romans 2 addresses the righteousness of our God. Our God is righteous. He is right and true in every way. So listen to the words of Romans chapter 2, verse 2 and verse 5. Here's verse 2. For we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. See, righteousness, rightness, is about doing that which is right, being that which is right, and God is based entirely in truth. God does not lie. His, his very nature is truthful. And so our God does all things based on truth. And then verse 5 says this. But because of your stubbornness and unrepented heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. We store it up for ourselves because we refuse to receive his gift of grace and the righteousness he offers. Storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. Listen to these words. When his righteous judgment will be revealed. When his righteous judgment will be revealed. God's judgment in his holiness and his goodness, in his truth and his righteousness. God's judgment is always right. And, and we understand that to some degree, every one of us. I mean, there's certain things we look at and say, boy, there are moments when there is righteous judgment, where it would be wrong and unrighteous not to judge. Somebody has found out to be a war criminal who, who, who during a war, they... they did unthinkable things to hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of human beings. And when war criminals have been found out, the world looks on and says, there is a righteous judgment for that kind of behavior. There are certain things that we look at and we say, there's certain things that are just wrong. When you hear of a person who's been abusive with children, who, who, who has over time with all kinds of children in different places has been intentionally, willfully abusive, and every human heart says, that's so wrong. That, being, that judgment for those things is righteous. And, and we, can, we can say that, that's just wrong. But the dilemma is this. We can look at those big things and say, well, there's certain moments when righteous judgment is exactly that. It's right. It's true. It's the right thing to do. But we often don't look at ourselves and our sin and see it as so bad that it deserves righteous judgment. That's because we live on a sliding scale. We grade on a curve, and God doesn't. God is holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. God is true all the time. God is pure through and through. And because of that, God can't wink or look the other way or sweep our sin under the carpet. God can't and won't do that. He is perfectly righteous. So he righteously judges sin. Pay attention now. 
Hear this. My sin and your sin. Our sin was bad enough that it cost the life of God's only son to pay the price for us. So so we need to be made righteous. God is perfectly righteous and he wants to make us righteous. The problem is we can become self-righteous and try to make ourselves righteous. And that's what's happening in Romans chapter 2. The Apostle Paul, and when you read it, and as we walk through the sermon, you're going to go back and read Romans chapter 2 with whole new eyes. And you're going to say, I get it. He's addressing certain groups of people who are behaving a certain way, who recognize the righteousness of God, their own unrighteousness, and they're trying to find a personal pathway to make themselves righteous. And the Apostle Paul is saying, your sin is so deep and real, God's righteousness is so great, that the only path forward is to receive his gift of righteousness. But we say, no, 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 I don't want that. I'm going to earn my own way to God and be self-righteous, make myself righteous. And there's two different groups being addressed in in Romans chapter 2 that are really trying to find their own way to righteousness. And I believe all of us, if we're not careful, we can walk down the same troubling road. So here's the question. How do you deal with the reality and the problem of sin? Your own unrighteousness. How do we deal with that? And here's option one that the Apostle Paul addresses in Romans chapter 2. Judgmentalism. For some people, the way they deal with the problem of sin, their own sin, is they become judgmental. That's what was happening in in this time in the city of Rome. They, They felt that their way forward to make themselves righteous was by judging others as worse than themselves. Focusing on the sins of others that were worse than their sins, therefore they could feel righteous about themselves. And what we're going to see in Romans is that doesn't work. But listen to what the Apostle Paul writes with that in mind. Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, You therefore have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else. There it is, judgmentalism. You who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. Again, God is righteous. God is true. He has a, he has a right to judge. It's just we don't. Verse 3. So, so when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them, and yet you do the same things, do you think you'll escape God's judgment? See, they're trying to get their way out of God's judgment by making themselves self-righteous by judging others. And Paul says, wait, every time you judge If you're in the arena and you say, thumbs down, what you're saying is thumbs down to that, which is thumbs down to me. And and that that kind of condemnation, uh, that kind of of judgment of others comes right back upon ourselves. So if, if in Paul's day and if you in your own life, if you struggle with judgmentalism, sometimes we can think, man, if I I just can see other people are bad enough, it can make me look good. I, 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 when I was thinking about this, I thought about a comedian I saw years ago on a show called Star Search. And this comedian was a big, tall guy and a pretty, uh, we'll say, full-figured guy. He was a big guy. And uh, he, he had somebody, he, he's telling this joke, and he says, you know, people say to me, you know, let, you know listen, how do, you, um, how do you build your friendships? How do you design your friendships? And he, and he says, well, here's what I do. He says, every time, he says, I always struggle with my weight, but every time I gain weight, I just just make new friends that are bigger than me. And here's what he said. It's easier to find new friends than it is to lose weight for me. So my solution is I find bigger friends because then they look at me and they go, you look great, you're fine. The comparison game. Well, spiritually, Paul is saying, he's saying, listen, you can't look at someone else and say, they're worse than me, therefore I'm righteous, I'm fine. It doesn't work that way. And And so we have to look and say, what are the tactics that can kind of become part of our lives or hearts when it comes to judgmentalism? Here's tactic number one. I ignore my sin by focusing on your sin. Here's the trick. If I can look at you and find sin in you. See, judgmentalists are always looking for the sin in someone else. Why? So they don't have to look for the sin in themselves. They're looking to judge someone else so they don't have to expect themselves to be judged by themselves, another person, or by God. It's how a child behaves. Well, well, what about what she did? What about what he did? I know as a parent, when my, when my sons were young and they get in trouble for something, they say, well, but my friend did this, but someone did that. And you know what I'd say? I'd say what every parent says through all history. They're not my kid. I don't, I'm not concerned about what they did. It's what you did. 
But there's that temptation to say, if I can point to someone else, it'll get the focus off of me. Sometimes Christians will do this with non-believers. We'll look and we'll say, you know, I'm pretty good compared to this person who doesn't know Jesus. But they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. They don't know Jesus Christ. But we can do this judgmental comparison game. Here's the second tactic of a judgmentalist. I minimize my sin by comparing it to your sin. The first is just to look and say, look, God, look at them, and we kind of, kind of get God to focus the way we think, get God to focus away from us by looking at others. But now we say, but wait, I'm better than so-and-so. I'm not as bad as that. And we think that we can be seen as righteous in God's sight because we're comparing ourselves to someone else as if God's going to play along with that game. And so I minimize my sin by comparing it to your sin. And, and this, this is, is just a, it's a dead-end road. You know, it, it's the person who says, it's the person who says, you know, I may have had a little indiscretion. Uh, I'm married. I'm in a covenant relationship, but I may have crossed some boundaries and, and I flirted with this person or I went and had a drink with this person uh, that's not my husband or wife and, or maybe I, you know, maybe I uh, crossed some lines physically and got a little bit involved, but, but that guy over there, that person over there, they're always running around their spouse. They're, they're horrible. I just, you know, I just crossed the line a little bit, but they're living on the other side of the line. Compared to them, I'm a saint. And that's the problem with this. In our minds, compared to them, I'm a saint, but God, who is perfectly true and righteous, sees our sin and doesn't compare us to somebody else. He compares us to the standard of Jesus, which is perfection. That's why he sent Jesus to deal with our sin. So when we try to make those comparisons, you, you know, I'm not that bad. I, you know, I, I, might, I might cheat on my time card and put a few hours in that I didn't work and maybe I, I may get a few hours of pay that I didn't earn. But, you know, that's a, but that guy embezzled $100,000. I mean, that's, you know, they're way out there. Compared to them, I'm a saint. But we aren't made righteous by being better than him or her. That's not the road to righteousness. You know, okay, I may have an anger problem. But man, when that person gets angry, they yell and they scream and they break things. And not me. As a matter of fact, when I'm angry, I don't say a word. Not for hours or days until they get my point. But my way of being angry is better than... You get the picture, right? Compared Compared to her, I'm a saint. Compared to him, I'm a saint. But God is righteous and true and he sees us. So we can't walk down that road of thinking that we can be made righteous, self-righteous, and righteous before God by, by judging others and comparing ourselves to others. Here's a question for you. And just reflect on this for a moment. Who do you compare yourself to when you're trying to look or feel righteous? Who do you compare yourself to? Well, I'm not like that. Well, I'm better than that. You don't stand before God compared to others. God doesn't find you righteous because you can point out and judge other people's sin. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is dealing with here. And then after dealing with his judgmentalism, how do I become righteous before a perfectly righteous God? Can I become righteous by being judgmental of others and comparing myself to others? No, it doesn't work. So there's a whole other group, a whole other approach to self-righteousness that the Apostle Paul addresses. That's legalism. Maybe it's not judgmentalism. Maybe my approach is legalism. If I can do enough good things, if I can follow enough rules, if I can come up with my own set of standards and hit those things every day, then God will see me as righteous in his sight. This is what Paul addresses next. And so how do we deal with the problem and the reality of sin? Some people say, well, by legalism, by, by following all the rules and regulations. So the Apostle Paul in Romans 2, 17 to 24 He walks through, he addresses this group of people who are living with legalism. They have set up their rules and their regulations and they have fancied themselves now righteous because they do enough right things. They've forgotten that they're, they've forgotten chapter one of Romans, that they're utterly sinful and they need the righteousness of Jesus, not their own self-righteousness. But they're trying to live uh, following the laws and the rules. And so when the Apostle Paul writes these words inspired by the Spirit, remember he's a trained rabbi and he's got a tongue planted in his cheek and he's sort of almost chuckling as he says these things. You have to hear the tone of the words because these people think that they are so good and so righteous. So listen to the tone as I read this passage because this is the heartbeat of of God speaking through Paul saying, do you really think you're so good that you are made righteous by your own legalism? You think that's the way to, to salvation? 
It's not judgmentalism. How about legalism? Well, let's, let's see what the Apostle Paul says. Romans 2.17. He writes, Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, they're like, well, I'm, I'm Jewish. They're looking at, you know, again, I'm, I'm all these good things. If you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and you boast in God, we have the law. God's our God. If you know his will, meaning I know all about the will of God, you approve what is superior you know, you, 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 because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced, and this is where it gets really, you have to get the tone here. If you are convinced that you, your sinful, broken Romans one person, if you're convinced that you, you are a guide for the blind. You're a light for those in the dark. You're an instructor of the foolish. You're a teacher of children. Because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? If you, if you don't believe me that the tone here is, do you really think you're that great? He's saying, okay, if you teach others, why aren't you teaching yourself? You haven't even learned the basic lessons. He says, you who preach against stealing, do you steal? Implied, you do. You're sinful, you're broken, you think you're so righteous by your acts of righteousness, but it's not enough. You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? And remember, Jesus said adultery is also in our hearts. You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Implied, all these things you accuse people of, you're doing. Now listen to this. You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? He says, you boast like you own the law, that, that you follow the law, that you're perfect before me without my righteousness. And he says, but that's not the truth. You dishonor God because you break the law. And now here's the key. As it is written... God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Legalists, legalists who think that they can follow all their rules and regulations and they'll please God and impress the world don't understand that the world ends up cursing God because of people who say, my righteousness is not found in Jesus' death on the cross. It's my following the rules. I am so good. I am so righteous. I follow. I don't do this. I do that. I follow all the rules. and I am so good. And he says that breaks the heart of God and it drives people away from Jesus. Judgmentalism doesn't work. Legalism doesn't work. But here in the area of legalism, the Apostle Paul goes on to use this, uh, this, this whole picture of circumcision and uncircumcision, an act of the body, an act of the heart. This is one of those places, this whole topic of circumcision. We could stop and read a plaque on the wall and study this a little bit on our journey, but I'm going to dig into that in the podcast. And what's going on in this part of the passage, as well as some other things that we're moving through a little more quickly, we'll dig into those in the, in the Shoreline Conversations podcast. If you just do a search, Shoreline Conversations, you'll find the podcast. So the tactics of a legalist, they have kind of their own way of going forward. The tactics of a legalist, they say, I rely on my knowledge of the law of God. It's on my knowledge. And, and that's their focus. I, can, I know the law. I follow the law. I rely on my own knowledge and following of the law to be made righteous. And it just doesn't work that way. And so you have to ask the question, uh, what, what are these tactics? I focus on my good works, the laws that I follow. That's the first tactic of a legalist. I focus on my good works. Look what I do. Look how good I am. And, and here's the reality. Uh, every legalist has their list. Every legalist has their list. To be a good Christian, to be righteous, you've got to do this, 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 and this. And you can't do this, 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 and this. I remember years ago when I was in seminary, one of our professors, uh, Lou Smeeds, he went to do his doctoral work in the Netherlands. And he was put into a group of pastors in the Netherlands, all older pastors. He was a seminary student. He was in his, in his middle 20s. And he's there with all these older pastors. He goes to the first pastor's meeting. And at the beginning of the pastor's meeting, they pass around a box of cigars. And every pastor takes a cigar and lights it up. And it comes to him. Now, he had been raised in a legalistic environment that was very legalistic, but his legalism came from West Michigan. And so he didn't smoke. That was one of those things you don't do to be a good Christian. So we just passed the box of cigars on. Then they passed a, a tray with shot glasses and some hard liquor. And everyone poured a little drink. And he passed it to the next person. And by the end of the meeting, all these pastors were just in, kind of having fun, but they were teasing him. They were saying, oh, you're the pious one. You're the holy one. You won't drink with us. You won't smoke with us. You think you're better than us. Well, this Lou Smeeds was saying no because in his upbringing, the legalistic don'ts is don't drink and don't smoke. But they didn't have the same list in the Netherlands. So they teased him so much, he decided the way to get back at them was to find out what, what was on their list of what a good legalist wouldn't do or would do. So we asked people, what do good Christians, good Dutch Christians in the Netherlands not do? 
And he found out they don't play cards, they don't go to the movies, and they don't dance. A different list, but a list nonetheless. So the next meeting, they passed the cigars. He said, no, thank you. They passed the hard liquor. He said, no, thank you. They started teasing him. And he said, you know what? I gotta be honest with you. I don't really like smoking. I don't really like drinking. But I love playing cards. I love going to the movies, and I'm quite a good dancer. And the whole room just went silent. And then all of a sudden, one of the older pastors goes, oh, and just starts cracking up and realize, oh, wait, we got our list, you got your list. They're different lists. The point is we're not made righteous by following do's and don'ts. We're made righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. And when we're legalists, we miss out on the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And then one more tactic of a legalist. I create a self-made religious image and then I start to buy my own press. I start to present myself. I'm quite good. I'm quite holy. I'm quite righteous. We won't share about our frailties, our struggles. We create a religious persona of outward perfection and sinlessness. We don't do what James says and confess our sins to each other. We don't share honestly about our struggles. We, pre we present ourselves in this legalistic way, as being above struggle. And, and those approaches ultimately don't work. What the Apostle Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 2 is God is righteous. He does what, only what is true and right. He wants to make us righteous. Our human tendency is, is to become judgmental. And thinking by judging others and comparing ourselves, we can be made righteous. He says doesn't work. Or become legalistic. And, I, and I'd ask you, what's your list of do's and don'ts? One of those things that, as a good Christian, I would never or I have to. But, and there's things we shouldn't do and things we should do. That's not the point. The point is we're not made righteous by following a list. We're made righteous by following Jesus. And so the Apostle Paul in, in, in Romans chapter 2 says, our God is righteous. He is true to the core. Our God wants to make us righteous. But to make us righteous and to give us his righteousness, which he offers through Jesus Christ, that's what we'll get into next week when we get into Romans chapter 3. But to give us that gift of righteousness, we have to set down our self-righteous behaviors of judgmentalism and legalism. And that's why the Apostle Paul goes after these and tears them down in the power of the Spirit. Because when we set all those things down and we say, I am not self-righteous, I am not righteous in my own power, but I want to be found righteous in you, God, then we rely on Jesus. And next week, we'll dig into that and continue this journey together in the book of Romans. Oh God, this is our prayer. That you would show us where we have become self-righteous. That you would show us where we have become judgmental of other people. Because somehow we think that by judging them, we make ourselves look better. And you will show us where we have become legalistic and where we actually believe that you love us more and our salvation and righteousness is based on how good we are or what we do rather than how good Jesus is and what he did. Lord, through this week, will you search our hearts? Take us again through Romans chapter 1 and the reality of our sin. Take us in our hearts through Romans chapter 2 and the gift of righteousness, the glory of your righteousness and that gift you want to give to us and take away any false sense of self-righteousness so that we might receive the gift that you offer us in Romans chapter 3, the gift of true righteousness found in Jesus Christ alone. Transform our hearts. Change our thinking and make us who you would have us be. We pray this in the righteous, glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you just a couple of things uh, that will, uh, I think, be important for different ones in different ways. If you need prayer for anything, would you simply call the number below and give us a call today. Right? We have people waiting to pray for you. They are delighted to come before the throne of grace with you and lift up your needs. And so call right now if you're willing, you want to pray. Also, if you're new with Shoreline, and we have a lot of new people becoming part of our church, even in the season online, will you simply text the word welcome to the number below? And, and as you text that number, we will respond back to you, and we want to give you a warm, personal greeting to Shoreline Church. I also want to encourage you to jump into the podcast. Right after I give a word of blessing, we'll have just a little, a little snippet, a little taste of this week's podcast. Uh, some of those diversions and stops along the journey, looking more closely at some of these topics. And I hope you take time to watch the podcast or listen to it and continue learning, going deeper to the book of Romans. 
If you want information about anything happening at Shoreline Church, just email the, the address below, and we will get back to you and answer your questions about when are we starting this, why are we doing that, how do we do this. We'll answer any questions you have the best we can, as quickly as we can. And then finally, giving back. We are so thankful that we can continue doing the ministry that we're doing. And we hope sooner than later back on campus, we're doing more on campus, uh, Sunday morning services on campus, and we're going to keep moving back on campus as we're able. But your giving helps all of our ministry happen online and on campus. So you'll see on the screen four different ways to give. I challenge you, if you're not giving yet, step into it. Take that step of faith and watch God bless you in that. As we close, I want to send you off with a word of blessing. May the God who is righteous and true to the core reveal to you that you don't have to be self-righteous, but he has made a way to cleanse you and make you right before the Father through Jesus Christ. May you know that truth and walk in that truth. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you back here on campus or online next Sunday as we walk into our third week of the book of Romans. God bless you. Have a great week. This is a clip from the second episode of our brand new Shoreline Conversations podcast. Stick around to the end of this clip to find out how to find the podcast online. You don't do this and you don't do this. And I even heard one person, I did a little study of this on a book I was writing one time. I was trying to survey people and one person said, uh, on the Sabbath day, <laughs> they said, we could walk briskly, but we couldn't run. <laughs> And so who determines what, oh. when you've moved? I mean, th think about how absurd it's gotten that, yeah. we're, that parents are having to discern between a brisk walk and you couldn't run on the Sabbath because that would be like playing. And, you can, and the Bible doesn't even say don't play on the Sabbath. Yeah. But, but people start to layer on their legalism. Yeah. And so I, th I think one of the good things for us to do is to look at ourselves and say, even if I don't, even if I don't have a really firm list, yeah. I probably have an informal list kind of list in my heart and my mind. So, so some people that grew up in a kind of a strong discipleship movement is, well, if I don't read my Bible for 15 to 30 minutes every day and maybe write a couple things in my journal and do a five minute prayer, then maybe God doesn't love me as much or maybe I'm not as good of a Christian. Mm -hmm. the, the, our legalism can become the, even the spiritual disciplines that should be a joy to open the scriptures and to talk with it. It should be a freedom and a joy that we pursue because we love to, but it can become this, oh, I have to, or I'm not really living for Jesus. Yeah. And so I think to search those things out and say, I live for him because I love him because he's good to me because he's drawn me with his kindness and his compassion and his goodness and his patience. Mm -hmm. And now I want to respond by living for him, not feeling like I have to check the boxes every day or tick things off my list that makes me righteous. I did, I didn't, therefore I'm good. No, I know Jesus. I'm made righteous. And now I live for him out of a passionate love for my Savior. You can find the full episode on our website, YouTube channel, or any major app or platform that hosts podcasts. Just search for Shoreline Conversations, and be sure to let us know what you think with a review and subscribe. 